Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the work that I'm presenting, of course, is not uh, really mine. I'm, I'm the uh, advertisement. It's the work of uh, eight or ten of my colleagues who have spent a lot of time and effort on this. In this audience, I don't think we need to ask uh, this next question. Uh, why are we interested in the, in the future? And, uh, and Per Kalvig has, has mentioned some of the reasons, but, uh, but let me emphasize a couple, couple of them. Uh, the change in metal use over the past uh, 100 years or so. Uh, this is on the basis of uh, per capita use uh, per person. So we set the rate for a bunch of different metals uh, at the same point in 1900 and then follow it out for 108 years, I guess it is. And, and you see that for a few of them, um, lead, silver, tin, uh, it's about the same level per capita as it was in 1900, but you have a group of zinc, copper, tungsten, and so forth that are seven or eight times higher than they were at that point. Chromium and nickel, more like uh, 40 to 60 times higher. And aluminium, a rather spectacular 1,000 times higher or so uh, per capita. And so we have more people now than we had in 1900. So that's a multiplier. And we have people uh, becoming increasingly wealthy. And that also is, is a multiplier on this. When we go to products, we can emphasize uh, this situation a bit more. 1700, we made a windmill with perhaps three different elements. 1800, we made steam engines with perhaps nine or ten. 1900, we made automobiles with perhaps 20 or so. And uh, today, any moderate technology product has perhaps 50 or more individual elements, each one there for a specific purpose to be the best choice that the product designer could make. And therefore, if any one of them becomes available, it is likely that the performance of that product will degrade. So as a couple of Japanese researchers said uh, in a paper three or four years ago, the materials scientists of the world in the 1980s, 1990s, were frolicking around the periodic table, choosing wonderful things, and as they did, and incorporated them into products, uh, we have become captives, really, of the use of almost everything. Well, what does this mean about scarcity? This, this talks about use, but it doesn't talk about scarcity in any way. It turns out to be pretty challenging, as I'm sure some of you know, to address this question of scarcity. What, what exactly do we mean by scarcity and what questions do we ask? Uh, so let me ask a few. And here's an obvious one. If we need more, why don't we mine more? This is a graph that appeared in Science Magazine uh, a few years ago, three or four years ago. Uh, what, it, uh, what it is plotting here is uh, millions of ounces of gold on the vertical and years from 1950 to 2010. The vertical bars are discoveries in that year of uh, gold uh, in gold deposits. And the shading is, uh, is connected to the concentration of, uh, of gold-containing ore in those deposits. So here we have a, a large deposit that is uh, highly concentrated, a lot of, lot of gold in it. Uh, same here. As we go toward more recent times, we have deposits that hold lower amounts 
of the ore. Uh, some of these are not yet perfectly determined. The red line here is not deposits discovered, but it's gold production. And, and we see here about 2,000, despite the fact that industry uses gold for many things, uh, electronics uh, and jewelry and a variety of, of other, other activities, uh, it looks as though that production has started to go down, despite a rather vigorous demand. Is this proof? This isn't proof, but it's a suggestion that we need to pay attention to, uh, to this situation, at least. Here's another part of the situation, uh, the flower garden of metals, uh, to remind us that we only mine for a few individual metals, uh, nickel, copper, aluminum, and that most of the other materials that we need come as byproducts in those mines. Uh, tellurium, selenium, cobalt, and silver uh, with copper, gallium uh, with aluminium, and so forth. So the challenge here is if the world doesn't demand enough copper from uh, copper mines, we are cutting into the supply of copper's companions, or nickel's companions, or zinc's companions, whatever. One of my graduate uh, students who uh, just a month ago took a job at the U.S. Geological Survey uh, managed to construct um, this, this graphic, and the idea here is to look at the companion situation and say what metals are available only as companions. Uh, on this color chart, that is 100% companion is bright red, and you see there's a lot of bright red on this diagram. Those are metals that we only get by mining the host and then recovering the companion. Anything in blue here is something that is mined for itself, chromium, manganese, iron, so forth. Uh, so those are the host metals, or in some cases, uh, what we call bachelor metals that are mined but don't have uh, byproducts that are worth going after. There are a few metals that sometimes are mined for themselves, sometimes come as companions. Uh, silver is an example. There are silver mines, but we get a lot of our silver from zinc mines, copper mines, and so forth. So the challenge here is one of the companions. Uh, not only how many mines do we have, but how many mines do we have that have the companions we're after, and will the host companion relationship enable us to work with those? Here's another question. If something's scarce, why don't we get it from recycling? This is an issue that's been uh, probably in the air now for 15 years or so, and, and so it's been looked at in some detail. It turns out that recycling statistics are really terrible. It's very hard to get good information on, on recycling. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the United Nations put together a committee to, to estimate where are we globally in recycling, and this is an evaluation of end-of-life recycling rates for the metals. So this is a product that contains the metal. If it's discarded, what is the percentage fraction that is likely to become reused uh, later on? So uh, we were able to divide this into five, five different groups. Greater than 50% reuse is the dark blue, and here you see the major metals, the cobalts, nickels, coppers, and so forth. And then we have some intermediate stages where the group uh, estimated, sometimes with data, sometimes with not very much, that there were, uh, say, 25% chance or 35% chance that something would come back. But there were a, 
a large number of metals, more than half of them, for which the group estimated that we don't recycle uh, essentially anything at all. So anything on red here could be quite useful material, the rare earths, uh, a lot of the materials used in uh, uh, high intensity alloys, uh, some of the solar cell materials over here. Uh, essentially we use them once, throw them away. Well, why is this? This is the next question we ask ourselves. Why is our performance here much poorer than one would hope? And the simplest first answer has to do with lifetimes of use. So here's our, our growing flow into use, but those uses are things like automobiles, computers, buildings. So they have a, a lifetime of use and they aren't available for reuse until after that lifetime. So if we have an average lifetime of let's say 10 or 15 years, and then if we recover everything, we have this much material uh, available from recycling. But at that point the demand is up here. So unless our use rate stabilizes and, uh, and reaches uh, reaches a plateau, recycling will help, certainly, but it will not take care of, of the challenge. One of our team looked rather more carefully at this uh, last year. I'll try to talk you through this diagram. If we have a material where this much in the dark blue is flowing into use, then there are various things, depending on the use, that that might occur with respect to recycling. There are some uses, shown in red, for which dissipation occurs, we'll never see them again. Uh, selenium and manganese, for example, in fertilizers. Most fertilizers contain several of the critical nutrients and they're spread on the fields, they're not recovered later on. Uh, we have several metals that are important in uh, pyrotechnics, or as the Japanese call them, fire flowers, which is kind of a nice phrase, um, well, we're never going to recover those either. There are a group of materials that when they're discarded, even if we collect them, we don't right now have an appropriate technology in place for recycling them. Uh, rare earths and polishing powders is an example. Uh, aluminum and steel making is an example. It's absorbed into the, uh, into the slag and, and not recovered. Then we have a group of uh, uses that are potentially recyclable, uh, often in alloy form or some other complex form. But in principle, if we get them to the recycling shop, we should be able to get them back. And then, inevitably, there are a few small uses that uh, probably fall in any of these categories and are not worth the time and effort to, to track them down. So if we take this approach and apply it to an individual metal, uh, this is for lead. Uh, lead currently, this market share, about 80% is used in batteries, and we know how to recover batteries, so they fall into the blue category, potentially recyclable. Ammunition, only about 3%, but that's dissipated in use. The firing ranges around, around the world, uh, we, don't, we don't bother to go in and recover the lead from the, from the bullets. <clears throat> Cable sheathing, very small amount, but right at present, uh, no technology that's set up uh, to recycle that material. So we, we add all these columns, we get the different fractions, and, and we can put this on a pie chart, and this is pretty good for lead because lead has this nice battery recycling part which gives us uh, almost 90% that if we get it to the recycling center, we'll reuse it. 
But lead is a special case. And if we do the same thing on one more periodic table, this time for recycling potential, um, we do have the major metals and some of the uh, uh, high value metals, platinum, iridium, uh, palladium, and so forth, uh, that are almost all blue, but there's an awful lot of yellow on this diagram. Uh, there is some, some red. Uh, here's, here's the zinc uh, dissipation in uh, tires. Zinc oxide is used to, as vulcanizing agent in tires. It's also used in fertilizers. Um, selenium, here's the part of selenium that's going into fertilizer, uh, and so forth. So we begin to understand why we're having challenges in recycling and to have targets for saying if we want to move something from a yellow or a red to a blue, uh, here are the places where it could make a real difference and, and we have at least an approximation of the numbers. Another reasonable question if something is scarce, why don't we substitute something else? People have done that for eons. If we look at that in today's technology, example here for copper, uh, copper goes into, as do almost all metals, a, a variety of different uses, uh, about 26% in electrical uh, applications, conducting electricity, 19% industrial, 13% in transportation, uh, cooling, plumbing, and so forth. And probably each application has a different best substitute. And the best substitute for plumbing is not another metal, it's a polymer of some kind. So we've been through each of these talked to industrialists and tried to say, uh, what's the best substitute and how good is it? So to continue with my copper example and taking the electrical major use, the best substitute we've identified is aluminum. So we ask a series of questions. Um, and I should say, if I, I didn't say on the earlier diagrams that I'm going to be doing a lot of 0 to 100 evaluations here or blue to red evaluations, red or 100 being the more problematic, the more challenging, of more concern. So aluminum is the best substitute for electrical conduction for copper, but it's not a very good substitute. And so its performance, uh, we rank uh, as 87 to 100 high numbers being of more concern. Okay? You then want to ask about the supply risk of the substitute. Do we have to worry about getting aluminum? Because you don't want to substitute with something that itself is challenged. Well, it's not a problem for aluminum, uh, so very rather low score there. You might want to say, if we do the substitution, is this an environmental uh, problem or benefit uh, for copper and aluminum. It's about uh, even, so runs right in the middle of our scale. Uh, you might want to know whether if we substitute it's going to cost us more. Uh, in this case, aluminum costs less than copper, so the number is low. And if we are looking at this on a country level uh, or a corporate level, you might want to say, do we have to worry about importing? where some countries might have plenty, but we might have to import everything. Uh, that turns out to be roughly neutral for copper and aluminum. Well, we've taken this approach across 62 metals that we've tended to deal with, and uh, through a, an al <coughs> algorithm that I won't uh, bother to, to present here, we combine all the substitution potentials for the major uses of each of the metals. And we get uh, one more of our periodic tables here where we have a mixture of, of colors, uh, poor 
or bright red here means substitution is a real problem for this metal. We don't have a substitute, a decent substitute for any of its major uses. Blue, on the other hand, means for all of the major uses, we have perfectly good substitutes. So what do you see when you look at the diagram? Not many blues. Not many blues. In fact, no blues, right? Which is saying that we do not think there is a single metal in the periodic table for which there is a perfectly good substitute for every one of its major uses. So we need them all at this level of technology today. There are some, uh, rhenium, rhodium, manganese, for which it doesn't appear that there are good substitutes for any of the major uses, or at least for most of them. So if you say, well, we'll just substitute, in that, th that case, you have real problems. In other cases, niobium, hafnium, and so forth, you can do substitutions for some of the uses, but not all of them. Well, what I've done is to give you a few examples of why one might be able to assess aspects of a metal's uh, uses and some of the concerns we might have, but I haven't given you any basis, any real basis at this point for uh, deciding whether one is of more concern than another. Yes, we can say on this chart one is of more concern than another, but I've shown you several charts. They go in different directions. And, <clears throat> and if we really want to, uh, to go beyond the examples, which are shown here, uh, rhenium and jet engines, problematic, uh, yttrium and phosphors, problematic, rhodium and catalytic converters, problematic, uh, uh, europium, phosphors, problematic, if we want to go past that and say, can we look at the life cycles, can we look at the criticality and then relate one metal to another and get a feeling for the comparative challenges there? We at Yale and a number of others have, have looked at these life cycle questions. Uh, this diagram probably familiar to some of you at any rate. Uh, the idea is that a uh, certain amount of material certain amount of ore is mined from the lithosphere, moved to concentrate, moved to refined metal through smelting and refining. Uh, intermediate products like sheets and bars sent on to manufacturing where they're made into final goods, automobiles, computers, so forth, used for a while, discarded to waste management where they may be lost or they may go back into the scrap cycle and be reused. This diagram can be done at different levels. If it's done at the global level, we have no, no boundary around the system except that of the planet. But if we do it at the country level, then we have a boundary, and this is where import and export has to be looked at. And we do that at these market points in between the different life stages where you can have uh, metal or semi-products or automobiles or scrap metal coming in or out of the country. And the goal of one of these diagrams is to put a number on every arrow and a number in every box. And that can be pretty challenging. A comparison I sometimes make is with the world of the biological scientist who looks at cells and, and uh, cell constituents and it's a very complicated system. But basically one cell does, uh, has the same uh, constituents as other cells and a cell in uh, Helsinki behaves the same as a cell in Copenhagen, but in the world of metals and metal uh, situations, uh, we have 
operators like this. This happens to be a scrapyard in uh, Manchester in the UK. And there is no other scrapyard in the world that looks like this. So metal operations are not uh, like the cells of the human body or the plant. Uh, they're individuals. This scrapyard goes after a certain set of metals. It does it with a certain efficiency. It uh, has its own processes. And a scrapyard outside Copenhagen or outside Los Angeles will be different. So inevitably, when we try to look at the cycles of metals, we're making estimations uh, of varying degrees of quality and one should not imagine that this can be done to three or four decimal places. Uh, we believe the first digit. We think we're pretty good at that. Uh, we'll probably argue about the second digit, but after that, uh, we don't, don't claim great accuracy. However, we've, we've taken this approach and tried to apply it uh, to look at the life cycles across the periodic table. And and I'm going to show you how we take that information, apply it to the world of the criticality, the relative criticality of materials, and I'll use selenium as an example uh, in a couple of places. Uh, first, let me talk about our methodology. This took several of us four or five years to, to put together because we spent a lot of time arguing about what should be the metrics. And I'm going to try to give you a sense for the complexity here without going into details, except to say that we evaluate this on three axes. One axis is what is the risk that this material will be unavailable, the supply risk. The second axis, vulnerability to supply restriction, is how vulnerable are you if you can't get that material? If it's not something you use, if you're a corporation that doesn't use platinum, you're not vulnerable to the risk of supply because this is not something you do, but it could be something that's very important to somebody else. Uh, the third axis is environmental implications, which for some materials are quite significant, but for many others are not. Uh, this is where you look at issues of toxicity, issues of uh, energy, embodied energy use, so forth. And as you can see, there are a number of different metrics, uh, six for supply risk, two for environmental implications, uh, eight, I think it is, for vulnerability. Uh, I could talk for half an hour about any of these, but I'm not going to do that. I just want you to appreciate that that they're involved here in creating what we think is a reasonable evaluation of criticality in what we call criticality space, the three-dimensional space. And by now we've managed to do this for every element that appears here in blue. And there are three others, uh, potassium, phosphorus, and helium that we're in some stage of working on. Uh, some of these require a little different approach, and so we're working through the methodology on that. But basically, unless it's a noble gas, or highly radioactive, or highly soluble, uh, we think we've looked pretty much at everything else. So this is what, in many cases, you would use for a stable, longer-term product of modern technology. So for a given, uh, a given element, we go through our set of metrics and, uh, and evaluate each one of them on this 0 to 100 scale. So every, every one of the metrics we're evaluating on the same scale, 0 to 100, on the theory that uh, a vice president or perhaps a rector could understand something on a 0 to 100 scale. And uh, so far, that seems to be the case. So without going into, <clears throat> into detail about the individual ones, except that I'll point out this is companion fraction for selenium. 
uh, bright red, so we only get selenium as a byproduct. We've chosen to take these, uh, these different metrics and uh, <coughs> treat them equivalently to do a simple average. But it's also possible because we've been tried to be very open about the information that we have that one could choose to say, well, that could be pretty important, but we also think that the, the governance indicator, world governance indicator, uh, is more important than a simple average. And so you could assign weighting functions to, to these, uh, which we explicitly haven't done but have opened the opportunity should somebody want to do it. So for selenium, we average supply risk and we come up with something that looks like it's about 70 or so. Of concern, but not of so much concern that it's at the uh, extreme red end of this evaluation. Environmental implications for selenium, um, there's a human health uh, evaluator and an ecosystem evaluator, which turns out to be largely uh, fossil fuel use and uh, resulting uh, carbon emissions. For selenium, these are not important, and we have a very low ranking on that, uh, that scale. For vulnerability, there we have to look at the location because this is where uh, different entities will have different vulnerabilities. So this is a ranking for the U.S. And, uh, and without going through all of these, except this is uh, substitute performance, substitute availability, and so forth, uh, we rank just, just below half on that scale somewhere around uh, 37, something, something like that. None of these numbers is very accurate. It's a little difficult to express the degree of uncertainty, but we have tried to do that because good scientists ought to always think about uncertainty in their information. So for every one of our evaluations, we estimate the uncertainty, put an uncertainty uh, bound uh, around them, and then compute using a Monte Carlo simulation uh, for all the variables for the full range of, uh, of uncertainty in the calculation. And then we plot all the points that result from that and, uh, and put the result in our three-dimensional space. This is for the copper group. So we have, we have copper in here, we have selenium. Three dimensions here, this is supply risk, zero to 100. Environmental implications, zero to 100. Vulnerability, zero to 100. Where on this diagram do I really not want to be? Right up there. High vulnerability, high supply risk, high environmental implications. Fortunately, none of these fall in there. Uh, and selenium is fairly, fairly modest. Uh, gold is higher on the vulnerability axis, uh, and that, that relates to the fact that gold in its ores is so dilute that the energy penalty you have to pay, and thus the carbon penalty, and thus the environmental penalty is pretty high. So in each case where we've looked at one of these elements, we've gone through all the variables, and <clears throat> should you want to, you can say to us, why is it that tellurium or lithium or something has a ranking where it does? And so here's, here's the individual elements, uh, here's cadmium's rankings, all the, all the different rankings that way. Uh, here's uh, the companion fraction that goes down this, this column. And, and so without expecting that you'll be able to, to really pick anything out of here, the idea is we can tell you where our evaluations come from and, uh, and why we think 
that's the case. And when we put those back on our three-dimensional diagram, uh, there we are, uh, this is what it looks like. So fortunately, again, we have nothing in this extreme corner, but we certainly have things that have fairly high uh, vulnerability. We have some things that have some pretty high supply risk. Anything in red here is uh, the light metals group, and, and that has very little supply risk and generally pretty low vulnerability. Uh, this group in the middle here is the rare earths, and this gives me a chance to say something I might have said earlier, uh, and that is that we think that our evaluations apply roughly to 10, 20, 25 years, that, that sort of thing. We're not measuring tomorrow's uh, change in the London Metal Exchange price for copper. We're, we're thinking long term here and trying to evaluate things over the longer term. So you get the idea here that there's quite a bit of diversity, but it's a little hard to pick out details in this three-dimensional diagram. So let me take the dimensions two at a time. This is for, this is global now. This is supply risk, zero to 100, and vulnerability on a global level, zero to 100. Uh, we've applied cluster analysis to the results, and we find that the metals fall pretty precisely into five clusters by that, uh, <coughs> by that method. And the one that's the most interesting is the ones with high supply risk and a range of vulnerabilities. And we see things here like thallium, uh, arsenic, antimony, indium, and so forth. Most of these are largely or completely companion metals. So that's, that's one thing that, uh, that we're being told. Um, here's, here's where the, uh, the rare earths are sitting. So in the very short term, there's, there's legitimate concern about supply risk for rare earths. But in our view, and I think in view of others, if we go out 10 or 20 years, we don't anticipate that this is going to be uh, a, a dramatic challenge. Here is a diagram, two dimensions of supply risk, again, global, zero to 100, against environmental implications, zero to 100. Again, cluster analysis with five clusters, and our group here that comes up at a high level turns out to be the, largely, I have not identified everything here, but largely the platinum group metals and some of the other precious metals. So rhodium, palladium, ruthenium, iridium, and so forth. Uh, in every case, in almost every case here, this is a consequence of embodied energy requirements. Uh, we do have, I think that's mercury. Mercury's somewhere in this cluster, and that's a toxicity uh, result on environmental implications. But that's rare, it's usually usually carbon situation. Let me revert back to that uh, supply risk versus vulnerability at a global level. And I show you this again because I want to contrast it with what you get at a country level. In principle, the information is there to do uh, an analysis like this for any country. Uh, we've done it for the United States partly because we're there and people are interested and partly because the data are a little easier than in some other places. But here's, here's the global diagram and here's the U.S. diagram. Global U.S. So the, the vulnerability changes a little bit, but the thing that changes a lot is supply risk. And that's because 
the U.S. doesn't have its own supply of lots of this stuff. Doesn't have its, uh, a domestic supply worth talking about as far as the rare earths. Doesn't have a domestic supply to talk about for tungsten and so forth. So on a country basis or in Europe on a continental basis, uh, you get a different look at the different criticalities uh, because of the import-export consequences and, and the fact that nobody has plenty of everything. Um, all right, let me stick, stick with this as I make uh, one more point. And that point is that because vulnerability depends on who you are and what questions you ask, there's no such thing, in my view, as a single universal list of critical materials. It is true that the European Union has published reports in which they have a, a list of materials by their uh, analytical approach, which differs a bit from ours. It's not quite as complex, and it's specifically directed toward European industry, so they should be a little different. Uh, but they've chosen to draw a line at an arbitrary point and say, we're more concerned about everything above the line and not so much about anything below the line and some things are very close to above or below and so you could argue about that if you chose. So if there's no one list of high criticality materials top to bottom, we can nevertheless talk about things that come up pretty high on, on most uh, evaluations. One is metals that are largely or entirely available only as byproducts. It's a risky thing to be a byproduct. You don't know whether the host will be mined. You don't know whether the byproduct will be recovered. Most of these materials are used in small quantities in specialized high technology applications. <coughs> Electronics, solar power, uh, offshore wind, so forth. Generally, they have no suitable substitutes or not very many across their spectrum of uses. So byproduct problems, specialized applications, and substitute non-availability. Now when I'm talking to groups that include educators of one kind or another, people that talk to the public or talk to students about uh, issues of critical materials, I think it's le legitimate and important to say, well, why should we be thinking about this hard? And here are a few reasons, I think. Modern societies made possible by metals and their routine availability in the future cannot be assured. And that routine is an important word because somebody like Rolls-Royce or Grundfos or other industries that use a lot of uh, these challenged materials, they really want to know if they design a new product that something's going to be around for 10 or 15 or 20 years not just available as an artifact on a shelf for which you're willing to pay 8,000 kroner. They want to know whether it's going to be routinely available at an affordable price. This is a topic that's highly relevant to students and educators. Not only do we have deposits here and there, but given the issues of supply and demand, of uses and recycling, uh, what are the prospects going forward? If we're serious about a circular economy, a phrase that's gathered more uh, force in recent years, we really need to, ch to focus on choosing materials with low supply risk and the availability to be pretty effectively recycled in the ways that we're using them. Uh, 
uh, by and large, that those uh, the focus, uh, especially among product designers, has pretty much been missing. And uh, shouldn't engineers and scientists be on the front lines in this discussion, which is certainly part of sustainability. Per Kalbig mentioned mid-century in his, in his introduction. Uh, by mid-century, we're going to have something like uh, two billion more people than we have now. They'll be wealthier. They will demand uh, the benefits of technology and wealth. And meantime, the virgin material stocks will have been depleted from wherever they are now to wherever they will be in another 20 or 30 years. And so the prospects uh, for supply and demand take on a different meaning. Uh, the natural scientist studying the cell will understand the cell much better than they do now, but it'll still be the same cell and, and their problem essentially will be highly focused. This problem is very diverse, it relates to all of human society, and it's a real challenge for the future. Um, this gives you some idea of where I think we are today on that discussion, and I thank you for your attention.